Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Sinise, and I'm co-chair of the program committee of the Gallery Council. We'll begin in a moment, but I want to thank you for joining us today. These monthly programs have been arranged by the program committee and have been virtual for over a year now. We're hoping that next year, we'll be able to offer some of our programs in person at the MAG. And if you would like to be there with us, please consider joining the Gallery Council. You can join online at mag.rochester.edu or by calling Gallery Council Office at 276-8910. We really hope you will join us. During today's program, if you have any questions for Nancy Valley, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Nancy will answer your questions at the end of her presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gaya Shakes, a member of the program committee who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be able to present to you Nancy Valley, our, our speaker for the morning. She is a visual artist and educator living in Rochester, New York since the 1980s. And she maintains a studio and gallery in Rochester in the Anderson Arts Building and an outdoor studio in rural Greenwood, New York, a source of great inspiration for her work. Her experience as an educator includes teaching visual arts at the elementary, middle school, high school and college levels, as well as leading professional development workshops for teachers and art workshops for adults in the community. Nancy has been a working artist since 1973 with experience in many visual art forms, including painting, printmaking, graphic design, sculpture, metal smithing, glass, and ceramic art. She is amazing, I must <laughs> tell you. So here is Nancy, enjoy. Gaya, thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for the Gallery Council for organizing this, this series of, of um, talks. It's great. Um, I'm happy to be here because I've had a long association with the Memorial Art Gallery as first as an educator beginning in the 80s, as an artist, and also just as a general member of the Rochester Memorial Art Gallery community. Um, I'm excited to be speaking to, to people that I've had a working relationship with, as well as new people. So I'm excited to share what I do. Um, during this webinar, I'm gonna start by talking about how my work has changed this year. Um, next, I'll share images of my past work, my creative process, my influences, my ideas. And then last, I'll speak about Studio 402. It's my studio gallery and how we've been able to continue to share artwork and support artists throughout this entire past year. At the end, I'm very happy to respond to any of your questions. So I'm gonna start now with some images. So I'm not in my home right now. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in my studio right now, I'm at home. I have a terrible internet connection at the studio, so I thought it would be safer to take some pictures and share them with you this way. This is the wall in my gallery right now, and this shows a big variety of work that I have. I put up some older ceramic work, some new printmaking, encaustic work. Now, this is another very important wall in my studio. This is my working wall. This is where the work gets done. I tend to put up all sorts of things that expire me, inspire me. Um, examples of things I'm working on, I can look at them, I can make connections, get new ideas. 
Um, and this wall changes every few weeks, depending upon what I'm working on. So because of this last year, I've done a lot of change and I'm wondering what was it that compelled me to make this move from ceramics into working with other media. And I'm wondering um, how many others have had changes this year, not just in art, but in other ways too. Here's a little background to the year. Um, I was really provoked to do some reflection recently because a friend asked me, why haven't I seen your ceramics around? not just because of the pandemic, but, but because I haven't been producing any. Um, I didn't have a great answer, but it really spurred me to grapple with the reason why I wasn't creating work in a medium that I have loved and I've been working with for the past 20 years. I wondered, um, I just, this is a great topic for me because it, it is a big change. So back in 2019, I started working on a body of work with three other artists to prepare for an exhibit at Main Street Arts in Clifton Springs. Our, our, um, our show was called Field Trip. We were four educators taking ourselves on field trips um, and responding to it. There were four people, we all sketched, took photographs, took this inspiration back to the studio but everybody's responses were completely different. Our show was scheduled to go up in March of 2020. So obviously that was a challenge. We um, debated, were we gonna put our work up? We knew that not many people would see it. Th these are the results of some of the pieces that you just saw on the last, um, on my table. This is them put together for that show. Um, so we had a debate. Did we want to do it? Did we not want to do it? Do we want to pass and try for another year? But ultimately, the gallery director, Bradley Butler, convinced us to take a chance, put up this work, see what happens. We couldn't have a, we couldn't have a first Friday celebration. At this point, everything was quiet. Everything shut down. Um, so... We, like I said, Bradley Butler was so inspirational because he became a real pioneer in these remote communications via Zoom um, interviews on his website. Remember Zoom bombing in the beginning? It was all a little bit risky, but Bradley was able to really pull it together. This is a group of my um, ceramic pieces that were in that show. And the other artists, Judy Goringer, Zan Brenner, Courtney Gradadoria, and you'll see in the next slide, all responded with different ways of looking at this. So our field trips were to all sorts of local parks and, and nature preserves and areas where we were looking at work. As if we were students, we put ourselves in our students' places to do the work. Um, at the end of March, like many others, Fear and panic was setting in. When the first wave of the peaking virus, I spent a lot of time, as you can see reflected in, in my first painting from that time, worrying about loved ones, traumatic public events, and frankly, getting tired of giving the side eye to all of the unmasked people in my large apartment building, it became very frightening. So my husband and I spent the better part of every week at our rural cabin in the Southern Tier in Greenwood, New York. This photo is from April 15th, exactly one year ago. We bundled up and just spent lots of time out there. This place has always been a long inspiration for my work. And I also have a studio there that I work in, in um, more pleasant time. Here's our cabin. So being in the woods, 
and focusing on the present was much easier there. I remembered a quote by an author, it's Rebecca Solnick, and she spent, talks a lot about spending time walking. Um, the book is called um, Wanderlust, and this is what she says. I wanted to live a life driven more strongly by curiosity than by fear. So at my cabin, I was able to really appreciate the open space and the open time. And I really focused on the land and the seasons. I felt like for the first time, I really, really was noticing what was going on. Um, in late March and April, obviously there was still snow, but when the snow melted, it revealed all this beautiful green, green moss, um, wild uh, gardenscapes, you know, that we were able to harvest. So time and changes just rolled on. And I hope that this next group of photos um, that you see will help you to see how I experienced this past year. As a, as a visual person, I am constantly photographing my surroundings. Um, this happens actually wherever I am. It doesn't have to be out in the country. I live in the city. I live right across from the Memorial Art Gallery and use my camera every, pretty much everywhere I go. My, my official artist statement says that I'm inspired by the physical cycles of the natural world and our place in it. This is one of the most important parts of my work, where I am in my community, in the natural world, in culture, in my family and friends. And this has always been a very, very big part of, of my own work. So this year, this past year, with no deadlines, no shows to prepare for, just open space in my studio, I spent a lot of time trying out new materials, not completely new to me because I was a teacher, but new materials that really helped me to represent what I was seeing and feeling this year, especially from my Greenwood time. So I pulled out all kinds of materials, encaustic wax, silk screening, painting, printmaking, drawing. It was like, um, I was like a kid in a, in, a, in a toy store. I just pulled everything out and made these pieces to, as a reflection of what I experienced during those other images that you saw of my time. Most of them are very abstract, but they're all recognizable. You can see the rocks made out of wax that reflect my time down in that river gorge. Collage. This is a branch from the sumac tree in the fall. And this is monoprint. Another thing that happened a year ago is I took a class at Flower City Arts in Rochester. 
on photo graver intaglial printmaking. It's quite a mouthful. And it was taught by artist and printmaker Pat Bacon. I wanted to try something new. I wanted to push myself since I had just finished a body of work in clay. And I have to say the process really did it for me. I have to say, don't be jealous ceramics. I also love the printing press. So I'll show you a little bit about this process. Starting with the photograph, this is a photo um, of the Anderson Arts Building in the alleyway, looking up at all these tangled vines that are there. So I decided to make a printing plate using that photo process. And here's one of my first prints. Now, people say to me, well, it doesn't look too much different from your, your photograph. And it's true, it has its own quality. It's a very traditional quality, but it also has possibilities for changing your work. So I took this one image, this one plate, and I started using it in all different kinds of ways. So here are some of the results of that. It's a medium that I'm quite excited about right now. Here are, other, here are some other prints made from the photographer process. And um, these are some works that are currently in a photographer show currently through the month of April up on the second floor of Flower City Arts. This is a show of 15 different artists who are students of Pat Bacon's. You can see I'm pushing the medium a little bit and I'm adding different materials and collage and monoprint and silkscreen to these. Okay, here's an image that I took a while ago. I call this the, the Wayback Machine. Um, if you know my work, you know that I people think of me as a ceramic artist. And I was trying to draw a connection between my work in clay and my current work. And what I have are a number of images of ceramics, and I'm gonna to read to you the titles. This one is called Terrain. Passage. Transformation. Unfolding. Strata. Origins. River. Grounded. Connection. Lineage. Messenger. Revealed. And finally, Conjuring Balance. This is a piece I did in the 1990s. And they, each piece is about five feet tall, hence the name. Studio 402 in the Anderson Arts Building, right across the street from the art gallery, has been my place to work for over 10 years. Um, I have a little bit of history. Well, when I hope you come up to my studio and later on, I'll let you know how you can contact me for an in-person visit. This is how it looks on the outside. The, this is a, um, an image outside the door that shows a lot of the exhibits that we've had the past few years. And so I decided to go back in history a little bit. This is also a good reflection for me. I spent most of my time there as a ceramic artist. Uh, 
Also, when I retired from teaching in the city school district, I began teaching adults in my studio. So this is from the time of teaching clay. I was also fortunate to have friends who were photographers and they helped me to document myself in my studio. This was probably about seven years ago. This is a more recent photo by Jones Hendershot. I've always had this wall in back of me when I work where I put up things that inspire me or that I'm working on. So a big part um, of Studio 402 is I share it with three other artists. I wanna call them creative forces because together all kinds of workshops happen in addition to exhibits. Um, figure drawing, which has been on hold obviously for the past year will be starting up again. And after a year of figure drawing, we held an exhibit this is from an exhibit of Anderson artists built, um, Anderson artists, all the artists in our building came together in my studio to have a show. This is also one year ago. So I think we started off with first Friday and then it was the shutdown. This is a great view outside the building. And this photograph was taken by Liz Morgan from the gallery store. We also did a lot of encaustic art workshops um, inspired by different techniques and people who, who were working with wax in different ways. And this also culminated in, in an exhibit. Karen Frutiger had an exhibit during the pandemic. But rather than happy, you know, we really missed those first Fridays. But we decided at a certain point to invite people to come in by appointment. And the people who did come in were very thoughtful. They spent a lot of time looking at the work, purchasing the work, having great dialogues, masked, albeit, but great dialogues. This was a fundraiser. We've also done some fundraisers there. Sculptor Sharon Locke created a series of sculptures to raise money for an organ organization called Angels of Mercy in Rochester. So this is my favorite time of the year, every January. We've done this for three years now. We host an uncurated self-portrait show. And the way to get into it is to just sign up. It happens mostly in art openings where we would just have a sign-up sheet. And you can see just from this poster, the variety of self-portraits. Um, you can probably recognize some of the artists in it. This is the one from 2020 called Vision 2020. And again, some people represented themselves very realistically, others symbolically, others abstractly. And it's been great for our community because we've been able to um, just have this great sense of community with people from all over in, in our community. This last exhibit, which just came down in March, was especially important because this happened with no first Friday, no opening celebration, but 63 different artists brought their work in, knowing that there wouldn't be a large public gathering at all. We were able to um, safely bring people in, of course, with masks and all our precautions, um, but it was a real celebration of who we are this year. Some of them literally have masks on, Others show who they are beneath the mask and, and what they're going through this, this past year. Of course, we miss those 
collaborations and those shared workshops. But I think um, we were really trying hard to do our best. This was my contribution to the self-portrait show. This is a photographer intaglio print that I made this year. Um, in addition to exhibiting all the self-portraits, I also asked each artist to write a short paragraph if they wanted to say something about their self-portrait or their year. Um, it was voluntary, but it was amazing how many people were happy to send in these beautiful descriptions and really insightful and sometimes surprising narratives. So I'm gonna read mine, it's very short. Like clockwork in late fall every year, crows converge on a leafless tree outside my studio window every day at 4.30 p.m. The days shorten, the sun streams in low. This year, nothing has changed, but everything has changed. So that's for me, that is me in a nutshell this year. I would love for you to come and see my actual studio, have a conversation, take a look at some of the work. Um, if you'd like to come, you can contact me. This is my email address. Um, I'm also gonna have my very, very first first Friday on May 7th, but I'm not gonna publicize it. I'm offering it up to, to you people who are watching this webinar right now, because I want to keep it very empty and open and available for people to feel safe and come up and take a look and have conversations. So you won't see this advertised in city newspaper or at ROCO, but I am going to let my friends know and I'm letting you know right now. Um, and in terms of coming to my studio, I'm there most days. So if you email me, um, I'll get right back to you and let you know um, when you can come, and I hope you come. You can see I'm having a little trouble. There we go. So that went a little quicker than I expected, but that'll give us more time for questions. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, we welcome your questions. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question or comments you'd like to share with Nancy, please do so now. And if Gaia and Susan want to unmute, you can also join me in this conversation. Nancy, we have some comments. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Joyful. Thank you so much, Nancy. So people are certainly enjoying uh, your work and your presentation today. Um, this was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Lovely comments. Nancy, yes. In your um, when you were going through the transition from your ceramics to other things, how did you feel when you were changing? A little bit like leaping off a cliff. I think it's like any kind of change, whether whether you're moving or experiencing something different because my, um, my identity was so wrapped up in being a ceramic artist. That's how people knew me. So I, I started making work and even though it was for fun and I was exploring, I'm still thinking, well, how, is, how will this be, you know, when things open up again, how will this be accepted? Will people still like this new work? Do I need to go back to ceramics? 
so yeah, it wasn't, it was uncomfortable. It was joyous, but it was also like taking any other risk. That was a good question. And that doesn't mean I won't go back to ceramics. Okay. For right that now. Be, that was going to be my follow-up question. I know, but for right now, I'm pretty happy with this printmaking process. Okay. Nancy, we have a question from Julie. She says, this was a lovely presentation. Could you describe the photo gravure and taglio process a bit more? I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but. It's a, like I said, it's a mouthful. Um, I know I'm wondering if Pat Bacon is watching because she is my teacher. It's traditional photogravure was from a, a metal plate. And um, this is called polymer photogravure. So it's, it's updated and it, um, it's a piece of metal with a photosensitized polymer painted over the top of it. And so when you have a, a transparency of a photograph and take it to the dark room, you can actually project light through that transparency. And um, it enables parts of it to be burnt out or washed out. So what you have is a plate with little tiny grooves and ridges, which hold the ink. Um, classic intaglio might be scraping or engraving or scratching into metal, but this is a photographic process. So once you have a metal plate, take it, you can take it to the printing press, rub ink into the plate, wipe it off, and what you have is ink left in the little tiny grooves. So as you wet paper and put it through the large rolling press, the ink is released from the bottom parts of the plate onto the paper. Um, there's a lot more to it, but that's a general description of that. Um, Pat's classes, I would take it if you're interested in this. It's, it's a wonderful class. Pat's a great teacher. Uh, one more thing about it is that I took the class in March and then when things were closed up, I sort of sat on the, the idea while I was working with these other materials. And I didn't come back to it until November because that's when I could re-enter Flower City and use the presses there. So I worked in November, December, January, and part of February. So that's when I really did all of that work. With, and Pat was a great mentor. She helped me right through this process to try to remember what I had learned past last March. It was a great challenge. I love, I love learning new things. Nancy, Pat Bacon is watching today and she says that uh, you did a great job and she's very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good student, thank you, Pat. <laughs> we have a question from Nancy Gong. Outside of the pandemic, are you regularly able to find time to experiment and explore new ideas and ways of doing things? I think because I, because I think because I did not have any deadlines or shows coming up, I felt a lot more free. My natural working mode is experiment, experimenting and mixing things together and trying things. I don't usually make the same thing twice. I usually, but I think this year was especially conducive, having all that time to myself, and not thinking about the work in terms of how other people will see it. That's a big switch over from creating something that's for a show or for sale. I hope that answers any. How do you market your work to get noticed by gallery owners? Well, in the, ter in, in, in the case of um, the show at Main Street Arts and other shows, it's really by application, knowing that there's um, a slot, send, sending in um, all my information, bio, resume, examples of my work. Um, that's the best way to get into a show. Um, I love group shows. Um, other ways are, uh, because I have my work up in my studio, it's a great place for other people to see my work and maybe offer a show or a place, um, in a, in another gallery or studio M marketing. I think a lot of artists will tell you 
marketing is a whole nother full-time job. I'd rather be making art like most artists, but I think it's also important to um, get your work out there. So that's another, that's another sort of task that comes along with it. I've also had work in the gallery store since Nancy Kelly was the director. So I've had a long history with the gallery store and that's been a great place for me to have my work. What is your day like? Are you constantly working every day? And do no. you change what projects you're working on each day? I think, well, I'm a retired teacher. So every day now feels like a gift because I have all this time. But like everybody else, I still have lots of responsibilities, right? There's bill paying day and errands and all sorts of things. But I, I think it's important to set apart a piece of every day to work in my studio or at home. I think that um, having a daily practice means that I don't have to wait for some idea to come to me. If I have no idea, I just start working. That's my process. Sometimes I have an idea that I can't wait to work on. Other times I'll just go and I'll just say, let's see what happens. Start making some marks, start, start painting colors, look through my photographs. Um, but I, every day I, I really try my best to get into the studio. Do you still do jewelry making? Nope. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a lot of jewelry. Um, I was making jewelry up to last year, and that's another thing I sort of let go of. That was part because my jewelry was made from ceramics and glass and metal. And that's another piece that I have let go of. I have, I know the art gallery. Um, the gallery store was great. They promoted my jewelry for many, many, many years. And I make it back to that also. And I'm just, so, I guess I'm on a clay sabbatical right now. Okay. I feel like you must work quickly because you have such a body of work. I can't get over it. There's so much. And it seems like this year you did a tremendous amount of work. And I'm just wondering, do you have several things going on at once or? Exactly. You saw my studio wall with all those things pinned up. Those were all works in process when I was working for the photo Graver show. So I, I was matching up different parts to collage together and that was things that would work together. So I might be working on 10 different things at one time. And it's good, it's good to start something put it away for a little bit or tack it up on the wall and just let it sit and then come back to it again. I find if I just push myself through one piece, it doesn't usually work. Mm -hmm. A lot of artists do that. They'll work on one painting until it's finished. And I rarely work that way. Also because in ceramics, I think I would, because ceramics, there's a lot of steps. You're working with wet clay, then you have to wait to let it dry. And that you just can't stare at it. It won't dry that way. So you have to make something else. And then and firing it the first time and then bringing it out and adding more layers of glazes and more marks and then firing again. So there was always time between the different stages of working with clay. And I think maybe that's what got me into the process of working on things, a lot of things at one time. Because not, that was not immediate. Pardon me? Do you finish them all? Eventually, or I tear them up and make them into collage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for, for the exhibit that you did at High Falls and you work with the poet. Yes. How was that process? It was fascinating. It was um, my poet, my friend, Lisa Harris, she lives in Ithaca, New York. She wrote a body of work and coincidentally it was about the seasons, which you got a little flavor of when I was showing you my images from the different seasons. 
and she wrote these poems. And like my work, her poems were also very abstract. There were different ideas in there about relationships and time and landscapes, which related to my work. But rather than, um, so she, rather than, it was a kind of a tricky process because I wasn't just illustrating her poems. I was looking into her poems and seeing what it brought out for me. So my work that came from each month of poems represented for me my, my reaction to them. So that's how we collaborated. It was different from being um, a book illustrator where you're trying to show what's in the poem. It was more my take on it. And I've done lots of collaborations before, especially with the Arena Art Group, which I'm a member of. And I worked on a piece with um, a metalsmith, Lori Cooley, whom some of you know, and we did a large piece together that was on exhibit. I love the process of collaborating. It opens me up to ways I would never would have thought before. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. If you have any further questions, you can um, post them now. Otherwise, we will conclude our program today. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Susan, Catherine, Gaya, and everybody who tuned in today. I'm just thrilled to be able to share my work today. Um, so send me a note, come on up, visit me. And um, thanks again. Thank you, Nancy, for sharing all of your interesting and beautiful work. You're a very busy woman. Just a quick reminder that we are taking a tour of the Legacy Project, Eyes of Our Ancestors on May 3rd. Um, it is an in-person tour and it will be at 11 a.m. And if you'd like to join us at East High School for this tour, please call Catherine at the Gallery Council uh, office at 585-276-8910. Our next program is going to be May 13th and it's going to be um, featuring Nancy Gong. And this is a don't miss program. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.